Substitute teachers, bus drivers, anybody involved in the school system, anybody involved in the school system, and students, I want to pray for you all uh, because, well, some of you have started back to school and some of you are about to start back to school, so I would like to invite you to come down here so I can pray for you. Would you do that? Gene's coming down. Oh, no, he's not. I thought maybe you're going back to school, Gene. Bus driver. Bus driver. Oh, he's going to be the bus driver. <laughs> uh, thanks, Gary. That was Gary Baxter that said that, Gene, just so you know. <laughs> Don't blame me. Oh, my goodness. Very good. Oh, this is terrific. Terrific, terrific. Well, I tell you, um, it is, you know, it is an important thing for us to pray for those who are in the school system, is it not? And those who are going back to school because, oh, this is quite an adventure. And um, we just, uh, sometimes it's a whole new chapter as you're in a new grade, you, you might be changing buildings. And so sometimes those things are scary. So why don't we pray right now over these kiddos and adults Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for those, first of all, who are involved in teaching uh, when it comes to our school system. We just pray for them, Lord, that uh, those who are teaching or substituting or uh, maybe even driving, whatever they're doing in our schools, Lord, 
I just pray for those adults that you would give them wisdom and discernment and protection. Lord, we pray for those kids who are heading back to school, both in public and private or even homeschooled. I pray, God, that you give them what they need to start off their school year, that, Lord, you would just give them courage, and that, Lord, you would just give them what they need to start off their school year right. Lord, thank you for going before us and for just uh, being there as we start these new adventures. In Jesus' name, amen. And so kids, Bob's going to come down and give the, the kids teaching now if you want to stay down here. And look out, he's got a crash helmet. <laughs> Virginia to uh, Hillbilly Hot Dog, and there's two things with motorcycles that are very important, and no, it's not the front tire and the rear tire. It's ice cream and hot dogs. And if you are if you ride a Harley, it's probably steaks and milkshakes, but for us guys, it's hot dogs. Well, I have a book that says... Uh, with God on the Open Road. It's a devotional for motorcyclists. It's not in print anymore, and I had a hard time getting it. I was on a missions trip, and there was another guy that liked to ride motorcycles there, and he says, hey, I got a book you would like. So I was going to read the one about the hot dogs and the ice cream that's in here. Her. Ed. This, this stuff's in here, and uh, but I'm not. We'll do that another time. I get to get on wild here. I'm too old to stand up through this whole thing. Okay, but there is a verse in here that I wanted to read. And it's about kind of like what you want to be when you grow up. And you know, as Christians, we're always kids. The uh, Apostle Paul always referred to the believers as children. So we don't yet know sometimes what we're going to be when we grow up. And... In 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, it says, Blessed now we are children of God, and it has not yet, it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when we appear, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Wow, now those are some pretty heavy words, pure. But what do you guys think pure is? Anybody got any ideas? What's pure? Okay, let me give you an idea. Uh, if you're really thirsty, do you ever drink water out of the pond? Or if you had a glass of water here, uh, purified water. So purified. What is? Spring water. Yep. You know, we all have our preferences. Uh, when I was learning to swim, I drank a lot of pond water. <laughs> Just confession time right now. But, you know, things like children of our Lord, children of Christ. I'm a child of Christ. Did you know that? And you guys, you know, you don't think of Bob as a kid, do you? Well, maybe you do. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. I have to be serious every once in a while. But what do you guys, you know, when you think about what do you want to be when you grow up, what would it be like to think about what you're going to be like as a Christian when you grow up? What would that look like? Everybody's always asking you what you want to be. You look like a boy. You look like a boy? There you had it. 
That's a good one, Mac. We, we want to do that. Unless you're a girl. Girls, what do you want to look like? Girls? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes I think as a grown-up Christian, we might, not necessarily, but you might be able to say the Ten Commandments. Or you might be able to, you might know all the books of the Bible. <coughs> or at least you'd know, well, that book sounds like it's an Old Testament or a New Testament book. Because it gets kind of funny when you're looking stuff up and <laughs> maybe you're the teacher or you've been there a while and you, oh, which, where is that at in the Bible? You know, so. This isn't working very well. <laughs> Maybe we should go back to the ice cream and the hot dogs. How's that sound? <laughs> oh, that's afterwards. And I saw a van out back. Some, some guy in the back row drove his truck with a van. And I, are we allowed to say what's in there? <laughs> I heard a rumor that if you were riding a motorcycle today, at least half of the ice cream and hot dog might even be here today. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to stick around and find out. I won't divulge all that. I'll let somebody else talk about that. But uh, as I can see, this is a total train wreck, and I should probably put my <laughs> helmet on just to survive this. I, you know, it really gives me an appreciation for school teachers. Can you imagine your whole day going like this? <laughs> We're going to have an all-day question and answer period, and the questions run out the first 15 minutes, of your eight-hour day. You guys are okay, though. Uh, yeah, got one going to sleep. Let's pray. <laughs> you did. I don't know how you do that, because it gets noisy in here when people sing. It's hard to fall asleep. Of course, I live next to a railroad tracks. You can? I can sleep through a whole train. I can. Huh? No way. You guys have a fight and one of you is asleep? Whoa. I'll tell you a secret if you don't tell anybody. One year I was at men's retreat and I got the snoring award. <laughs> Not everybody knows this. Don't let the adults find out about this. And the next morning, I think it was before or after I got the award, Rex Musser. Don't let Rex hear this. Rex Musser and a few guys grabbed me. I was, I was asleep, and I must have been breaking windows by this time. And they picked up the sheets off the bed with me in it. <laughs> And they took me outside. <laughs> I didn't wake up till I hit the grass. <laughs> oh, don't tell anybody about that one. <clears throat> okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you. That even in your scripture, it talks about us as children. And sometimes, as we get older, we think, Lord, what am I supposed to do for you? How am I to fulfill what you want me to do in my life? And sometimes... As children, it takes a little longer to learn things than, than other children. Some get it faster. But it's not a race. Lord, help us to wait on you and to know when you've instructed us as to what we're to do and be. Lord, I pray a blessing on these children as they get ready to go to school and, and live life this fall and winter. And that, Lord, you would just bless them with knowledge and wisdom and how to use it, but mostly about you, and it's in these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. What an honor to win the Snoring Award. <laughs> it's a secret. Oh, sorry. It's a secret. It's a secret. So we are going to start a new habit this morning 
to help us create a new pathway of truth. Does that ring a bell? A new pathway of truth. If you've been hanging, hanging with my sermons over the past several weeks, you've heard me talking about a pathway of truth. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by reading this scripture right here, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And so we're going to read this together. Can you get it up there, Charlotte? Mm -hmm. Nope. Okay. We're froze up right now. So we're not going to do it right now. <laughs> hey, th nope. That's Genesis. Oh, my. Uh, no, that's, that's not the right location. So anyway. Well, hey, maybe we'll come back to it. Yeah, that's last week's. No way. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, that was last week's. I recognize it. <laughs> well, hey, so we will come right back to that. So hold that thought. Okay, Charlotte, we'll come back to you. So no, no sweat. Don't, don't worry about it. You and I are needy people. We're needy. How are we needy? Well, we are in constant need to be built up in our faith. To be built up in our faith. You and I need to be continually reminded that there's a God. He is good. And that he's on the throne. And that he loves me. And that he paid the ultimate sacrifice for sin. And he did that for me. We need to be reminded of these things. And even as born-again believers, we need, we need to see God, and we require edification. And that's the first blank in your notes. The first blank in your notes. We need edification. That's a fancy word, isn't it? Edification. But the word edification just simply means built up, encouraged. There are those who edify in your life, and you can think of maybe some specific faces that come to mind. There are those who <laughs> do the opposite to you in life, and those faces might come to mind too. Those who feel like they might, might I know it sounds bad, but they're like life suckers, you know what I mean, out of you. You just feel like, oh, so drained after you get done with a conversation. But then there's those people that you talk with, and after you're done talking with them, you think, I feel great. That today's going to be a great day. That's someone who edifies, and that's what the word edification means. And that is what you and I need as believers. Why do we need a continual building up? Why do we need that? Well, first and foremost, we live in a dark world that reminds us that it is fallen. First and foremost, we live in a dark world that reminds us it's fallen, and this fallen world reminds us of the prince and power of the air, Satan, the enemy. And this world, meaning those who are not of the faith, they are opposed to God and his plan of redemption through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we, we have seen evil manifested uh, on our TV and computer screens and phone screens, uh, with the Taliban in Afghanistan. I mean, we are reminded of evil. And that is why we need edification. I spoke last week about Moses and Israel. How God showed up and provided sustenance for them in the wilderness in the form of manna and quail. <coughs> after rescuing them from the Egyptians first, right? That was... That was just an amazing thing. And Moses had an incredible task in which he was called as Israel uh, continued to be just very difficult people to lead. Those of you who have been in leadership before, those of you who have been in management or some sort of form of leadership in your profession, uh, or maybe just a situation you found yourself in in an organization you're a part of in which you found yourself as a leader. You know how it is when you've got people who are difficult to lead. And in chapters 19 and 20 of Exodus, Moses 
He gives account uh, of, of how he and, and the Israelites met with Jehovah God at Mount Sinai. Do you remember that story? Moses met with Jehovah God at Mount Sinai, and it was this powerful encounter. And so we're going to go to Exodus 19, verses 4 through 12. But first, I'm going to have Charlotte back up to slide number two. And this is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So I want us to be in a new habit of providing a pathway of truth. A pathway of truth so we can get out of maybe some ruts that we might been in, be in that, that are, are full of false teaching. We are going to create pathways of truth. And we're going to do that by reciting together. That's right, together. You get to read out loud 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And why do we do this? Because we're getting ready to read other areas of Scripture. And we need reminded that all Scripture of what this, what this passage says. So read it with me. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What a passage for us to read. Because this reminds us right here that the scriptures, what do they do? They equip. That they are breathed out by God. So, that's going to be our new habit. So now, Charlotte, fast forward a few to Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 through 12. And in this passage, oh, this is great stuff. I am so excited about sharing this all with you today. Um, in Exodus 19, verses 4 through 12, it says, You yourselves have, been, have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So this is God giving instruction to Moses on what to tell Israel. And so, next slide. So, so Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord like I find that kind of humorous, like God didn't know what they said. But anyway, yeah. verse 9, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around saying, take care not to go into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. And we'll stop there. So this is that that place in scripture where God is meeting with Moses on Mount Sinai. Israel's right there. And in chapter 20, Jehovah God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And right after God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, we read in Exodus 20, verses 18 through 21, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick dark darkness where God was. It appears in this passage that Joshua... The guy, you know, who's, who's helping Moses, Joshua. He's like partway up the mountain. He was allowed to be there. You know, he could get somewhat close. However, Moses stood before Jehovah God to hear what he had to command. 
And if you noticed in what we just read, Israel was supposed to be able to hear when God spoke with Moses so that they would believe him forever. In Exodus 20, 21, it says, the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And if you continue to read, you witness all the commandments that Jehovah God gave to Moses. It's chapters 20 through 31 in Exodus. It's very extensive. And then in chapter 32. So understand what, what's happening here. We have Moses up there meeting with God. We've got Joshua, he's partway down. We've got the people of God who are supposed to be right there, like near the base They're supposed to, of the mountain. They're supposed to be hearing this the sounds of God giving Moses these commandments. Exodus 32, 1 through 6. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears, uh, your wives, your sons, your daughters, uh, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your, and, and they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered a burnt offering and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. What happened? What happened? The Israelites were to stay near enough to where they could hear the voice of God giving these instructions to Moses. They moved too far away from God out of earshot. That's what's happened. They moved too far away. And again, Moses had every reason to be incredibly frustrated with the Israelites. He was crushed. He was furious. Exodus 32, 19 and 20. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire, ground it into powder, and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. He was mad. He was fuming mad at what they had done. The main difference between Moses' anger towards Israel and our frustration and disgust with our world is that Israel was God's chosen people. They were God's chosen people. They were supposed to be following after God. God had rescued them out of Egypt, out of that slavery. They saw all these amazing miracles take place. And Exodus 33.11 says that the Lord used, he used to speak with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So we have Moses here with this fellowship, this relationship with God that was like no other at that time. God speaking to Moses like a friend, face to face. Like a friend. And to check out the rest of the chapter, Exodus 33, 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, see... You say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. 
And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight and I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. And I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on a rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face, you sh uh, but my face shall not be seen. So brothers and sisters, we have so much we can learn from this passage. Moses needed built up. He needed edification. The sinful, hard-hearted Israelites were bringing him down. And Moses needed assurance. And he asked, please, please show me your glory. Please show me your glory in verse 18. And you and I need this kind of building up as well. Yes, we have the abiding Holy Spirit. He confirms our faith. Yes, I know. I am his and he is mine. Our, our, my identity is secure in him. However, many times that takes place through God's ambassadors. And you might say, well, who's that? That's you. That's you. If you claim Jesus as your Lord and your Savior... You believe that Jesus died on that cross for your sins many years ago and rose again so that you could be forgiven of your sins. You are called his ambassador. And as his ambassador, this is exactly what we are to be doing for one another. Building up. In Jude chapter 1, of course, Jude only has one chapter, but in Jude 3 and 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So the chapter starts off to, and it says, I didn't read it, it's in the first couple of verses, but it says, to those who are called, to those who are called, and it says, contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. We contend for the faith because our world, with the enemy on his throne, continually attempts to draw us away from the faith. So we contend for the faith. We must contend for it because, as Jude wrote, ungodly people have crept in and have perverted the grace of God. And this isn't simply a selfish contention. I'm not just looking out for me. I'm contending for the faith because I'm defending my faith. Uh, only no, we contend for each other's faith. I contend for your faith. You contend for my faith. We go to bat for each other. We build each other up in the faith. Why? Because of this world around us. This world around us. And one of my favorite passages that provides for you and for me just some great practical
teaching on what it means for you and for me, uh, the church, to build each other up in the faith is found in Ephesians chapter 4. It's in Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 11 through 16 say this. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, who uh, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And we'll move on to and jump into verses 25 through 29 where he says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak to the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give peace to those who hear. If there is any you ever have a time that you are wondering how a church is supposed to act turn to Ephesians chapter 4 Tur turn to Ephesians 4 we need to be intentional intentional about meaningful edification do you know what intentional it means purposeful it's on your radar. It's in your vision. We must be intentional about meaningful edification. We must go deeper. We must go deeper. And as Moses pleaded with God to see his glory, we need to be sure to glorify God by encouraging and edifying our brothers and sisters in Christ. We must do this. So, Charlotte, I'm going to ask you to back up a couple slides. Uh, back to Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16, if you would, please. Um, so so look, look in this passage. In verse 12, the word equip. In verse 13, the unity of the faith. Mature manhood or womanhood. Okay, it, it's not meant that only men can be mature, of course. You, you know that's not true. Uh, so anyway, stature of the fullness of Christ in verse 13. The stature of the fullness of Christ. That's why we edify one another. So we all grow up in our stature, the fullness of Christ, so that you know Jesus better. That's why we edify one another. And then down in uh, verse, same slide, verse 16, oh no, next slide. Uh, verse 16, makes, it makes the body grow. You see that there? It makes the body grow. It builds itself up in love. Next slide. Uh, near the end, verse 29, no corrupting talk. Why no corrupting talk coming out of your mouth? Because corrupting talk does not build up, does it? It tears you down. Slander? Ah, oh. Tears you down. It tears the other person down. What does that cause? Does that create unity in a church when you slander someone else? No way. No way. It creates division, dissension, friction. Anything but unity. Anything but a building up. Only such as good as building up fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who are here. 
We need this. We need this so much. And Charlotte, you can skip ahead to the next slide. And, and this, this is exactly what we need. Just like Moses was pleading with God, show me your glory. God, show me your glory. I know you've said, God, that, that you're going to do that, you're going to use me in this way. And, and yeah, you're going to bring Israel and we're... You know, his chosen, Israel's his chosen. Show me your glory. And you may not realize it or not that the person sitting next to you or near you or across the room from you right now is needing that as well. They need to see God's glory. They need to see some sort of demonstration of God. And as we dismiss today, you know, we're going to have this great time of, of baptism and picnic. Let me please exhort you or urge you to have meaningful, deep, edifying conversation in this room, even. Why is it that when somebody asks you how you're doing, now, of course, this pro I'm talking about your neighbor, it's not you I'm talking about, because you wouldn't do this. How are you? Oh, good, good. I I'm good. You say you're good, but your dog died, your truck quit on you, or it burned up, and, and you're fighting with your spouse, and oh, good. It's all good. Why? Why can, I, can you not say, I've had the crappiest week of all weeks. I'm having a tough time. Why not? And don't, let me encourage you, the person who hears that, don't say, oh. Yeah, and, and you walk off because you're scared to death. I, I don't know what to say. Maybe you don't have to say anything. Maybe you just got to put your arm on that person. Maybe you just need to say, of this, God's with you. In all of this, he never left you nor forsook you. He's with you right now. It might appear that God checked out. He didn't check out. He's with you. It's edification. That's building up the saints that might be crying out right next to you. God, show me your glory. I'm hurting. God, help me to know you're real. Help me to know. And maybe, maybe as, as you need to be honest in answering someone who asks you how you're doing, maybe you would be willing to not just say, how you doing? Good, good. And just you just move right on. You're done shaking hands with him. You greeted him. You did your job. But maybe... Maybe you can s slow down a bit and say, how are you really doing? How are you really doing? How's your faith? Did you know you can ask somebody that? How's your faith? How are you doing? How's your faith walk doing? How are you doing in your relationship with God? You're allowed to ask that. It might sound pretty scary to you. But if we call each other brother and sister in Christ... We've earned that right. It's not just earned a, an earned right. It's about caring and loving one another to edify each other. We long to see each other grow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.
Thank you so much for your scriptures that speak loud and clear about how we are to build each other up in the faith. As Moses cried out, God, show me your glory. He needed build up by you. Why do we think we would be any different? So God, may we be intentional about building one another up in the faith and not just keeping everything at such a, a bland and cheap surface level. Lord, may we be willing to go deeper in our conversation with people. May we be willing to pray over someone and not be afraid when those people might share tough things with us. May we be willing to get into the grind with them and encourage them and help pull them out. It's what you want the body of Christ to do. To edify each other. Ah, oh, Lord, forgive us for those times that we, that I have not built up. Maybe I even tore, down, tore someone down. Maybe, maybe slandered. Please forgive me. Oh, Lord, may we be intentional about this. It's about the furtherance of your kingdom. It's about... It's about your church being deeper, more mature, looking more like you, Jesus, so that when we exit this place, we can walk in a manner that's that in which, Lord, we are equipped to be shining brighter lights, even brighter for you as we leave. We love you so much, Lord. Thank you for this time to open up your scriptures and to catch a greater glimpse of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand up and sing our last song. Freely, freely. <laughs>
give. Freely, freely give. Be sure to edify one another. You're dismissed. Well, before we dismiss, how about I go ahead and, well, actually, so we have the baptism coming up next. And so that's going to be, so it's uh, just a couple minutes before 11 right now. And so I'm guessing we'll be up at uh, the, the lake at Marmon Valley. So those of you who don't know, we exit out the back of here and uh, to our shelter house is right out back where we'll have our picnic. And right behind the shelter house, there's a lane that goes right up to the lake at Marmon Valley Farm. And that's where we'll be having our baptism. I would guess we'll be there in about 15 minutes. You're all are invited. Uh, to, to stay and, and witness the baptism. And, and if you can't make it up the hill, it is a little bit of a hill to get up to where the baptism is. Um, I'm sure uh, somebody here would be willing to hop in their vehicle and because you can drive up that hill and uh, get, get you up there so you can witness the baptism. And then we'll be having our meal after. God bless you all.